The Tom Woods Show, episode 1806. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Very glad to be kicking off Anthony Samaroff week on The Tom Woods Show. Anthony Samaroff, as longtime listeners will know, hosts the Scottish Liberty Podcast, and you will be able to tell there's a very slight indication when you listen to him that he is indeed from Scotland. He is the author of Universal Basic Income, For and Against. I'll give you a hint. He's against. He's also currently at work on a book on the fallacies of Marxism, and he is very accomplished as a therapist and I think has a lot of interesting psychological insights that we can benefit from. And not too long ago, really just a matter of uh, two or three weeks, I had a very nice lunch with him. We did an escape room together. And I thought, doggone it, I got to talk to this guy more. So the result of that is Anthony Samaroff Week. Anthony, welcome. A great pleasure to be with you. You have entered a very elite group of people, you realize, having a week of the Tom Woods show devoted to you, right? This is nothing to be taken lightly, my friend. I know. I, I don't take it lightly. I feel the air of responsibility around me. Yes. To, <laughs> to deliver a good week. All right. Well, let's let's give it a shot. We're going to start off with something that's a little bit on the autobiographical side. I consider you to be Scotland's greatest libertarian. Now, that's not oh. saying a lot, but you are probably Scotland's greatest libertarian, at least living libertarian. Right. Well, we'll have to have a little bit of a fight with Tom Laird and some of the other people in the movement. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on Team Anthony. I, I don't know these people that well, so therefore, you're the best one. Right. I'm always uh, kind of reminded of the conversation I heard that Walter Block had with Murray Rothbard when he said, how many libertarians do you think there are in the world? And Rothbard said, eh, about 24. I think we're at the about 24 stage in Scotland, so I'm, I'm top of a small league table. Well, as you know from the experience in the U.S., it goes from that number to like a million or two mm. in maybe two generations. So just sit tight and keep doing what you're doing. All right, I want to start off, given you've done so many different things already and you're knowledgeable in a number of different areas, I want to just talk about how it is that we got to have an Anthony Samaroff in the first place doing all this good work. You're in Scotland, of course, which is not, as we've said, really a hotbed of libertarianism. Mm. So how is it possible that you go from being surrounded by people whose opinions are fairly conventional to being Anthony Samaroff writing a book about what's wrong with uh, universal basic income and stuff like that? What was the trajectory? Hmm. Well, I guess I was I had a fairly active interest in politics. I wouldn't have considered myself to be in the mainstream spectrum at all. I guess because I didn't agree with the Labour Party who were meant to be left, I thought I was like further left than that. Although I guess, um, you know, I was kind of open-minded on issues like gun control and I, I did support a market economy. I just maybe, maybe I thought something like what we think the Scandinavians have, it would be better, although I wouldn't put it in those terms, you know. Yeah, a market, but like regulation and lots of social services and things like that. So then I guess one of the big things was seeing Ron Paul run, you know, and his videos around 2007. It wasn't the only thing, but around that time, you know, there was this view that we were in the midst of some awakening and people were realizing what was going on in the world, as was symbolized by the anti-war movement and the opposition to Patriot Act. Now, we didn't have the Patriot Act here, but there were a lot of, there was even a documentary made called Taking Liberties about the Labour Party and how they were encroaching upon civil liberties in the UK. And we, we had similar phenomenon here and some pushback, but the pushback was from the left, largely, up until that point. So Ron Paul was the first like conservative or right-wing person that I saw giving it to the, the warfare state. And I was brought up in that belief that, you know, if you're on the left, you're anti-war and you're for civil liberties and you're also like left-wing on economics. And if you're on the right, then you're pro-war 
and you're more authoritarian when it comes to civil liberties. So that's what probably why I put my myself on the left, like from a kind of humanist perspective. My experience at debating right wingers or conservatives was my dad, who you know didn't really have the Milton Friedman esque command of the subject. He was he was an entrepreneur and he was sort of instinctively conservative. So when I defeated him in debates and he didn't change his position, you know, because I was reading Michael Moore or whatever, Noam Chomsky or what, whatever was around at the time, I was more informed than him. That made me think my positions were stronger than they were. I was on YouTube around that time putting out videos. I thought, well, you know, I'll put out my sort of progressive views because I have the same debates over and over again. And uh, maybe I can just summarize some of my views. And I got gate crashed by all the libertarians around that time saying, you know, you're wrong on this and you're wrong on that. Go and watch this video. Go and watch that video. And I kind of went a little bit down a YouTube rabbit hole. And over a couple of years, I changed my views. I, I wasn't an easy sell. I needed to be sold on the utilitarian argument for libertarianism before I accepted the deontological argument, if you'll excuse the technical language. I, I finally accepted the NAP, like, you know, don't hit people, don't take their stuff, don't commit fraud, etc. But only after I was assured by all the ANCAPs on the YouTube that, you know, people really wouldn't be starving on the streets and, uh, and what have you, because I needed to see how this society would work, I guess, in a practical sense. And that, that's why it took me a couple of years to be sold on libertarianism, but I was obsessive. You know, I was watching video after video on YouTube over two years, and, and that's how I became a libertarian. Can you actually say something about what you mean by deontological? Because I think that is how most people do it. They, they accept the utilitarian argument first, that they get some sense that this can work, hmm. and then they are more open to considering the deontological argument. Uh, yeah, so deontological theory of ethics means that the morality of action is defined by the action itself rather than the consequences. So principled-based morality, like don't initiate violence or don't steal something, these are like principles. Whereas utilitarian, a utilitarian moral principle would be the consequences of an action define its morality. So it might be okay to murder if there's if, if it leads to much better consequences. And the usual way that people measure that is the greatest happiness for the greatest number, but there might be other consequentialist views of ethics as well. That's just the main one. And this is one of the interesting things because I part of my studies were in philosophy. And it's really interesting how when you study philosophy in any mainstream institution, how deontological ethics is taught is usually Immanuel Kant, whose basic philosophy is, you know, don't cut in the line because if everyone did that, then that would be chaos. So uh, make the guiding principle of your action. If everyone did it, then that would lead to a good result. Uh, and that's put up against utilitarianism. But they never mention uh, voluntarism, which I think is extraordinarily intuitive ethical theory, which is, I mean, most people accept consent as a, on some level as a principle of morality. You know, the reason why we define theft or murder or causing another person harm, you know, we don't consider it to be assault when it's a boxing match. People have an instinct that consent is a very important moral principle, but they don't explore voluntarism as a ethical theory in mainstream educational institutions, which I think is really, really funny because it's so instinctive. And, you know, if all the philosophy students were getting exposed to it, I'm pretty sure a lot of them would accept it. Well, I want to go back. You started talking about philosophy. There's a number of questions in there I want to ask you about. Let's go back to you as a young man. You were a theater critic when you were a student? Yeah, that's one of the things that I did. I actually had a little module in philosophy when I was in school, and I really loved it. I didn't go to university until I was 22, and I went to study music and philosophy. Actually, I went to, to university after school as well, but I wasn't in the place to do it, and I chose uh, you know, something like computing science, which doesn't suit my personality at all. I'm asking this, by the way, just so people know where I'm going with this. 
because this is what really got you into writing and you learn things about writing and then these things carried over into the libertarian projects that you've worked on. So that's where I'm going with this. It's not just Anthony Samaroff minutia, right. much as I could deal in that all day. Yeah, and I, I do tend to jump around from topic to topic. So I apologize if I'm not always completely coherent in speech. But yeah, so I was lucky in a way that I went late because one of the problems we have is people are not very interdisciplinary. They get very specialized. And uh, this is why like philosophy hasn't subsumed the insights on epistemology that come from economics that were observed by Mises. And, you know, Hoppe clarifies Mises on these issues. Coming back around. So the good thing about studying in Glasgow University is they had a program where you could choose three different classes in your first year and then continue with them or drop one and choose something else, which allowed me to get into a lot of different departments. And my my final degree was in music and, and philosophy, but I did modules. I did a module in theater. I did a couple of modules in education. I did one on like Eastern religions, Eastern philosophy, and um, all sorts of stuff. I even did, I even tried one on astronomy, but it was too mathematical. So I dropped it, but I still learned something useful from it. So that helped me learn a lot of things. And I had a very heterodox teacher in the music department. And when I did my module on opera, he, he gave us an assignment was to review an opera and another theater piece. So I did that and I thought, well, you know, that was kind of fun. I sent it away. I sent one of my reviews away to a local, well, um, a Scottish publication. And the editor there said, okay, I'll send you out to something and you submit a review and, and, and we'll take it from there. And he sent me out to something and that was it, like, bang, you know, I, over the, the next 10 years, I maybe reviewed over 150 plays and so that was that was really really useful yeah as a writer that was really useful and it definitely has an influence on the way that i write about libertarian issues i'm sure we'll um, unpack that a little bit more well in fact let's do that i mean it seems a little bit different to go from uh, theater criticism to economics almost like there's nothing that one can inform the other with well i guess all writing is useful writing when you're learning to write but there there's a lot that i learned from uh, writing a review, one thing is being able to squedge a whole bunch of points into a short space because you know you're you're maybe given anything between 150 and 250 words. It's not a long time, but what you need to do when you're watching the play is select what is worth commenting on and find a way to condense it into a small number of words. And I use that in my economics writing in terms of trying to get more bang for my buck with arguments per paragraph. Like I really try and get all the relevant information into the paragraphs. And another thing is start that's really, really important. Like I edited some reviews as well later on, maybe, I don't know how many, but a significant number for less experienced writers. And one thing I often found is they'd have an impactful sentence buried somewhere in the second or third paragraph. And a lot of the time what I do is I grab that sentence and put it right at the beginning of the piece just to show them, look, here's your, you know, start off strong. Here's your sentence, like bang. That kind of creates a little bit of an atmosphere or something. And then another big thing is having an angle, like knowing where you're going with a review. The easiest reviews to write and the most enjoyable ones to write where when I left the theatre with, I know what my angle is, I know where I'm shining the light on this piece. And then everything falls under the umbrella of that angle. And that's so important when writing something that's polemical, where you're, where you're trying to convince people of your point of view. And finally, two related things. One is writing in a chatty tone. Now, I'm not going to do down economists, but let's just say that they're not exactly known for their ability to write in a conversational style that anyone could read. And what made me write about economics, I mean, most of my exposure to economics was through podcasts. 
when I started reading the books that libertarians were recommending, I was like, right, well, this is interesting for me, but I can't see anyone that's not already an enthusiast reading this. I, I mean, a lot, a lot of good stuff has come out since then. We're talking five, ten years ago. But when I started writing about it, it was just, I think I could do it more conversational, more chatty. And part of that is the, the hardest thing, I don't know if you've found this, but for me, the hardest thing about being a writer is learning to write simply. It's so much easier to write big, long, complicated sentences than to say things simple, like you're just chatting to someone. And I think that's where like writing theater reviews is where I really learned to write simply. I'm, I'm really thankful that I went to university for that reason, because when I first went there, I mean, there was the makings of a good writer in me, but I just wrote the longest sentences and I didn't know where to, how to break them down, you know, semicolon here, a comma here, and being forced to write for assignments along with having this adventure into being a theater critic really helped me refine my style and it's so funny because when I took on this role as a theatre critic I was like you know what am I doing this for are people are is anyone really reading any of this stuff then like who cares what I think is it weird me getting in to see all these things for free just so that I can write about them and I, I didn't like writing critical reviews and it was shrouded in confusion but it's played such an important role in my development and it, it just goes to show you never really know what the purpose of experiences that you're having is when you're in it. It's only later on you can go, well, I'm, I'm sure glad that happened because it really helped me. Hey folks, let me take just a brief minute to be sappy with you in promoting our sponsor, BetterHelp. New Year's resolutions are not cheese ball. They're a fantastic opportunity for personal growth and to overcome obstacles that have been plaguing you. So let 2021 be an opportunity for you to get to the heart of what's been interfering with your happiness or what's been preventing you from achieving your goals. BetterHelp assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed professional therapist. This is not self-help, it's professional counseling. It's online, convenient, professional, affordable. And if your counselor isn't an absolutely perfect match for you, they'll give you another one. So whether it's depression or family conflict or anger or relationships or grief, or whatever else is plaguing you, you owe it to yourself to check out BetterHelp. They get outstanding testimonials. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com woods. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash woods. Let me say a couple things on this myself. In terms of uh, writing, I couldn't agree with you more about writing simply. Now, simply doesn't mean that you write like Ernest Hemingway. Mm. I just find him impossible to read. It's just irritating. It's too simple. Mm. But the key thing is, for me, when I was in the 11th grade, I was a high school junior, I had an English teacher who made me a good writer. She forced me to become a good writer. I walked in there... I was Tom Woods. I was ranked number one in the class. I always get an A on everything. Mm. And she was killing me on my papers. And I thought, does, does she not know who I am? I'm Tom Woods. I mean, I don't get grades like this on my papers. And she was saying, your writing is too wordy. Right. You need to be more concise. And I thought a good writer was flowery with lots of big words. No. First of all, you choose the word that has the shade of meaning that's appropriate for what you're trying to convey. And no other word. So there are some words you just never use. There's, there's never, ever any reason to use the word prevaricate. That should never be used. There's no shade of meaning that it contains that you can't convey with the word lie or deceive. So don't do that. But it wasn't just that I used big words. It was that I used too many words. Mm. And so one of the things that, this is why I recommend blogging to people. Even if a million people don't read your blog, that's almost not the point. It's a good exercise to learn how to write concisely. Force yourself to write only a 250-word post on this topic, and you want to write 600. Write 250. It will force you, like a surgeon, to remove each unnecessary word until you find you're a vastly better writer. So that's very, very important. In fact, I will put on the show notes page an episode I did a long time ago on 
ways you can become a better writer. And I mean, I do, you know, I have a lot of new listeners who follow me now because of the virus stuff. And so I maybe need to tell them, I do have a lot of experience at writing. That is one thing I can speak on with some authority. So there is some reason to listen to me on that. So that alone, writing more concisely is a major step forward. And the great thing about this teacher, this is the sort of thing I would have scoffed at that the teacher was a softie, but she would let you rewrite the paper mm. and just, and you could rewrite it as many times as, as you had the determination to do. And of course I was determined, there's no way I'm going to get a C on a paper. That's not going to happen. And the process of that is what helped me learn how to get rid of the excess words yes, and how to make sure I'm writing it as clearly and as concisely as possible. What an experience. And I, I wish I could go back and I wish I knew how to contact her and say, I've made a career out of writing as a best-selling author, and it, I wouldn't have been any good at it if it hadn't been for her. Wow. Yeah, and, and, and I love that she let you resubmit papers because that is a big problem with the education system where, you know, you're lumped with a mark, but that's just going to encourage people to choose the easiest courses and things like that. The courses that I learned the most from in uni were in topics that I wasn't well-versed in, and I was proud to get a B, Rather than, you know, I, I got an A in lots of courses, especially going as a mature student, but they might have been easy for me. So it's kind of like, it's, it's not really a good setup when you're basically discouraging people from challenging their, themselves because they're looking at the grade rather than the intrinsic benefit of the course. And that's something I found, I think being a mature student really helped me with, I was there to learn. I was there because I wanted to improve myself, not just because I thought, you know, you go from school to, to studying a degree. And there's always something new to learn about writing. Like, I, I wouldn't recommend university for everyone, especially people who are just doing it because they think it's the thing to do. But if you want to become a better writer and things like that, then you can use the experience to to forge you. I think one of the things that having to do all those reviews impressed on me was that, you know, there is actually an art to nonfiction. Like I thought, you know, fiction was artistic writing and nonfiction was um, unartistic, especially a theater review. Who, who would think that there was an artistic element to that? But the more you did it, the more you saw the creativity in it. And even today, there's always something to learn about writing. I find that writing an essay is solving problems really. And, a lot of the time there are problems in the text and when it gets difficult, it's usually because you're trying to solve several problems in the text at the same time. Like what order does the information come in? How are you going to express these thoughts in a way that I, I often see it as like Ikea furniture, right? I've built up a model in my head of what this bed frame should look like. But the thing is, information and knowledge is not linear. It's more like a spider web. Everything links to everything else. But I need to unspin that spider web into a thread. I'm mixing my metaphors now. Something you should be careful not to do when writing. I should hasten to add. But like, you need to unravel it into a thread so that you can communicate that information that's non-linear in a linear fashion so that the other person can like build up that framework like the Ikea bed frame in their own mind and see it as vividly as you can and there, there, there's always like I often learn a new thing when I'm trying to solve a problem in my writing like why can't I get this to work I need to learn a different way of putting across information and it's like well I've just earned a new trick there I, I can use that deliberately I learned that because I had to learn it in order to solve this problem in the text but now that I've learned it, I can do it voluntarily in the future. These are such useful skills to have. Let me say parentheses, by the way, with regard to reviews. Not theater, but movie reviews. I was a huge fan of Roger Ebert, who died a number of years ago, but I was able to read a lot of his reviews as he was writing them, and I just loved them. He, I didn't agree with his politics, but that didn't seep in all that much. But his reviews were works of art, in my opinion, so beautifully and elegantly written. And in general, I would not look at his review and then decide whether or not to see a movie. I would see the movie and then say, 
I wonder what Roger Ebert thinks about this. And then I would go, and then I would get another dimension of the film thanks to him. And it's just a, something as simple as a movie review, but it enriched my experience so much. So I very much miss him. Anthony, we've got just five minutes left because I want to be really reasonable with your time given that we're doing an entire week here. So I want to keep them to about 30 minutes. And I had another topic I want to jump into, but there just isn't time. So let's take the remaining time for you to add, because uh, I think writing is a great topic to talk about. Whether or not the audience are writers is almost irrelevant. We're all readers. And to me, I find it interesting to know how the sorts of things I consume in the form of the written word, how they're crafted and, and what the author's intents are and, and what the author hopes to accomplish and get across to me. So let me throw it back to you. What, what else can we say in the last few minutes? Well, one of the things I loved about writing reviews, and I think it's strangely relevant to learning about Austrian economics, is I always thought the best achievement you could make is to bring something to someone's attention in a review that they wouldn't have otherwise seen but once they see it they can't help but see it so you get that ah moment like like you said you've seen the movie already but if that reviewer points out some underlying philosophical theme that you didn't see before then you love the movie even more because you, you you see that emotional valency and you're like wow well, yeah that's so true and even better if it teaches you something about movies in general that will help you appreciate them more in future and I remember one example that my mom actually brought to my attention once when I when we went to see a play and the climatic scene didn't take place on the middle of the stage. It was somewhere over and 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 she complained that that wasn't conducted correctly. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And that changed the way that I looked at uh, the way that the climax of a play is um, delivered forever. Similarly, I just, that's one of the things I really loved about writing and learning about Austrian economics is it illuminates the world for you. You never look at the world again after you gain some of these insights. You suddenly see, it makes the world comprehensible to you and you can see the beauty of the market. You, you appreciate the fact that you can go to the store and get a pen for under a dollar more, but you also, you, you feel like you understand how the world works and how the economy works. And I guess uh, that's always been of interest to me in, in every field in philosophy. Like, I don't like the philosophizing that's completely out of touch with our day-to-day -day experience of life. I love learning things that, that make the world comprehensible to me. And then I love communicating them to other people because I'm like, check this out. This is really cool. This is really beautiful. I want you to see this too. And I, I think that's always underlied all my work in any field is the desire to show other people something that I think is beautiful or something that I think is cool so that they can appreciate it as well. It's funny you speak that way because that's exactly the way I look at the proper understanding of economics. It really is something beautiful. It reveals to you an order that can be hidden or obscured by your own eyes. Mm. Your own eyes looking at, I think Mises maybe put it this way, in theory and history, I'm not sure exactly Mises or Rothbard saying, if you were just to look at Grand Central Terminal in New York and not think it through, all you would see is just a bunch of people running hither and yon, and that would be the end of it. But when you think through what's actually going on, you realize that each one of those people has a goal and is pursuing that goal, and that that's not chaos, but it's actually order that you're observing. Well, likewise for the entire economy, it, it looks like, again, to a Marxist, it looks like, well, there are all kinds of, uh, there's duplication of production and mm. it's not the way I would run it if I had a bullhorn or something. But the more you understand it, the more you perceive the hidden order beneath it all. And once you perceive that, you do want other people to understand it. In my case, not just because they'll derive intellectual pleasure from understanding it, but because they'll stop wrecking it 24 yeah, hours a day. For sure, <laughs> you know? absolutely. All right, well, let's let's wrap up there. We have a lot of topics to cover this week, but let's wrap up by telling people how to follow Anthony Samrat. Now, there are many ways to do that, and you wear many hats. So That's pick true. a hat and tell people about it. Yeah, check out the Scottish Liberty Podcast. We've got over 170 episodes now. So if you want some advice on where to start, message me on Facebook, and I'll tell you some of my favorite episodes. I hope to provide some clear thinking and good communication on 
some of the topics that I love illuminating to people that I see the beauty and order in. Well, thanks again, Anthony. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. All right, everybody. Tomorrow we get into the real substance of Anthony Samaroff week. So I hope you'll join me for that. And thanks so much for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free. And we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.